Amen. So in the musical Hamilton, uh, which follows the life of Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, uh, told through hip-hop music, obviously, what you find is that as the story is progressing, the main story through America, occasionally you get a, uh, an interlude almost where King George III comes out. And King George III of England comes out and comments on what he sees happening. First, his absolute, complete uh, bewilderment that the colonies are, are revolting at all. But what's in, what I want to talk about, though, is the second time that he comes out. After the revolution has been successful, after America is now free from Britain, King George comes out and he uses the same, uh, they use the same sort of song all three times with different words. And the second time he comes out and he, sa- and he basically says, okay, great job, you're free now, whoopee. But he says, I have a question for you. What comes next? Now that you're free, you have no idea how hard it is to lead. You have no idea the problems and the struggles that are going to come. You have no idea how to handle what comes next. And then it's sort of a, a petulant sign-off. He goes, when your people hate you, don't come crawling back to me. And I, I couldn't stop thinking about that this week, that question of what comes next? Now, Wednesday, we gathered and had a special Bible study sitting in the raw emotion of the failed terrorist coup at the Capitol on Wednesday. We sat and reflected. I didn't have any answers, and so we sat and simply tried to make space for God to speak and move and work with us. And whether you are on Facebook or YouTube, you will be able to find that Bible study. It's still around, and if you are still in that grieving and broken place, I would recommend that you go back and you watch that. But after a few days of praying, talking with Sarah, wrestling with all of this, I felt like we needed to talk about what comes next. What comes next? What do we do with all that we have experienced, with all that has come against us? What comes next? In a book I was reading recently, I found this great quote. You know, we always talk about that uh, when trials or difficulties come, some people just rise to the occasion, right? You rise to the occasion. But the author said, that's not really how it works. See, most of the time, we don't rise to the occasion. Most of the time, we sink to our training. We don't rise to the occasion. We sink to our training. We revert to our training. So what does that mean? It means what you have practiced over and over and over and over, that's what happens. When difficult times come, when you have to have these gut level reactions, when the completely unexpected bowls you over, most of the time we revert to our training. We don't rise to the occasion. Now that may not feel like it applies to you. What training are you talking about? I'm not in the military. I'm not on Star Trek. What, what, what are you talking about? Well, what I mean is every single day we are training. We are training ourselves with the choices we make, with the decisions we do. When you are an athlete in training for a big race, you don't, uh, it doesn't just stop when you are out on the track running. Every single decision you make is a choice about how you are going to train, what you're going to do. Are you going to eat this or not? Are you going to get enough rest or not? Are you going to drink this or not? All of those things factor into the kind of training that you're going to have so that when something unexpected happens, you know exactly how you are going to react every time. So what sort of training do we revert back to when the unexpected happens? Well, obviously, you are watching... (laughs) (laughs) Over the internet, you are watching 
a worship service because we can't be together live. So there you are at least have some level of interest in Christian training. You have some interest in how God may want to move and work in you and shape and change your life so that it can be different. And that's what we're talking about now in that kind of training. When the unexpected hits us, hits our country, hits our family, hits our church, whatever, we revert back to our training. So what kind of training does God intend for us? Well, thankfully, Jesus made it pretty clear. If you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn as we look at our scripture for today. It's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, and it's going to be starting in verse 34. That's John 13, starting in 34. Hear the word of God. Now, Okay, before you hear the word of God. (laughs) Uh, What I want to do is sort of set up the scene a little bit. Jesus has brought his disciples in for their last meal with him, the last supper. He has already washed his disciples' feet. He knows that his death is coming. And for the next few chapters, he is going to be sharing verse after verse or, or wording after wording with them, teaching after teaching, so that they will know as much as they possibly can to understand what they are called to do when the unexpected hits. Even at this last second, he is trying to jam in some training so that when the unexpected bowls them over and they revert back to it, it will be something meaningful and helpful. So, He has already been talking about all of these sorts of things. He's explained to them why he washed their feet. And then in verse 34... So in the middle of that paragraph, in the verse 34, he says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are are my disciples. They will know we are Christians, the song says, by what? By our love. Your love for one another will prove that you are my disciples. What training are you supposed to revert back to when the unexpected happens? You love one another. So this is this is uh, a bold and ridiculous claim for Jesus to make and a difficult challenge for us. But what's even more remarkable than the challenge is that the early church, the first couple of centuries of believers, they lived it out. And you know how we know they lived it out? By the complaints of those who weren't Christian. This is one of the most remarkable things that you'll ever hear or that I've ever read the emperor Julian in the fourth century was trying to create a pagan revival to get a bunch more people into his pagan religion. He is writing a letter to one of his priests and he is complaining and he's complaining about Christians. And he doesn't uh, call them uh, judgmental. He doesn't say that they're closed-minded. He doesn't say any of those things. You know what he complains about? He complains that these Christians are so busy doing good work that not only are all of the orphans, all of the widows, all of those in need among the Christians, not only are they covered, but the love that overflows out of that Christian Christian community is so great that they are taking care of all of the pagan widows and orphans and those without anything. Their Christian love is pouring over into these people who don't even believe in their faith. How will this emperor who is trying to work against Christianity know that they are Christians? He'll know because he can't make any headway with his revival because so much of God's love has been poured out by these Christians. I don't have to tell you that most of the time, when you hear people who are non-Christians complaining about Christians, they are not complaining about how loving we are. They are not complaining about how there's not anybody left to do good works for because the Christians are doing good works for everybody. 
What do we hear when we hear complaints? Now, some of us get defensive and we, and we want to dispute it. I'm not asking that question. I'm not asking whether it's valid or not, because for the people who complain, it is valid. So let's pause right there and just say, what are they complaining about? Well, they're calling us judgmental. They're calling us hypocritical. They're saying that we care more about politics than we do about loving people. They are saying that we really don't stop and listen to neighbors unless we have an agenda of using them in some sort of way. They call us racist and homophobic. They have all sorts of terms that they use. And we can have a separate conversation about the validity of those claims, but that's what people say. When people think of Christians now, they don't think of us by our love. How are we supposed to be people who are known by our love? What is this supposed to do, and how is this supposed to shape us? If we, tr- if we believe that what Jesus had said was true, that the way that people will know that you truly belong to me is that you are choosing to love, what does that even look like? Because for lots of different people, love looks lots of different ways, right? Because for some people, uh, you know, Love has beautiful, wonderful, deep, and rich, meaningful sort of ideas. For other people, they've been hurt by the ones who said that they loved them. And so they sort of look at love and uh, wonder if it's going to bite them again. Thankfully, again, Scripture reminds us and helps us see what true love is looks like, what the kind of love that God is talking about, the Greek word agape, this kind of love meaning self-giving love, the kind of love that is powered by and only available through God that we live out, that kind of self-giving love, we hear about it. And if you have ever been to a wedding in a church, you have probably heard this passage. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And the, we use it in weddings, right? We set this ideal because it sounds fluffy and beautiful, but the reality of it is this is not just when we're all dressed up and looking pretty. The reality of it comes in weeks like this week when we are forced to revert back to our training and it reveals who our char- what our character is and reveals who we are and we are forced to look and see if this is the kind of person we've let God turn us into. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth, the Apostle Paul says, and of angels, but don't love others, I would be only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And we skip ahead to verse 13. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. So what does love look like? Love looks like that. That's what God has called us to. That's who God has called us to be. And if you are like me, when you put these pieces together like this, you go, okay, well, I'm out. Maybe somebody else can do that because that's not me. That wasn't my reaction this week. That was not immediately what I thought was, let's figure out how I can love all of these people. That's not where I went. Thank God that God knows that too. Because as soon, we didn't read it all the way through in the John passage, but as soon as Jesus explains all of this, Peter, 
the disciple, of course, Peter, steps up and goes, listen, Devane translation coming here, listen, they may all choose to abandon you and not love you, but this guy right here, I'm going to love you forever. I'll love you even if they kill me. And Jesus looks at him and sighs, and he goes, you know, Peter, before the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Can't you imagine Peter going, nuh-uh, 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 filled with bravado, filled with this untested confidence that wherever he goes and whatever he does, he is going to stand by Jesus. Peter is the perfect model for all of us. We all talk a big game. And like the philosopher Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. When life punches you in the mouth, you revert back to your training. When Peter saw his life in danger, he denied Jesus and ran. Jesus knows we can't do this. Jesus knows we aren't capable under our own strength and our own power to live like this. And so in the very next chapter, chapter 14, Jesus says there's going to be one. Once I leave, one will come that will advocate for you, will comfort you, will protect you, will be God with you. The Holy Spirit is going to come and live within all believers and empower them and change them and shape them into the people God's calling you to be and me to be. That's what our training, we are undergoing training right now if we are a Christian. Now, you may have missed a few sessions. You may have not done the things you needed to do, but God is working. God is desperately working in you with whatever you will give him. If you only give him this much, then God will work with that much. If you are brave enough to give over more of your life, God will work with that too. But whatever you are willing to give over to God and give over to God to transform you into one who loves more fully and deeply and richly, God will use every bit of that. Because that's how we're called to be known. We're called to be known by our love. What does love look like? It looks like 1 Corinthians 13. It does those things and lives out those things. So if we are brave enough to do that, if we are brave enough to choose to live out that kind of way, what does it do for us? Why why would I go through the trouble? The rest of the world doesn't have to deal with all of this hassle. Why would I go through the trouble? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One And we see this played out in sharp contrast this week. When we have our focus be on the love of God, then everything else takes uh, takes a step down. Everything that we think is life or death takes a step down because we trust that what God has for us and how God is shaping us will see us through anything. Meaning, both sides conservatives and liberals in our country have an idolatry of country. We believe without realizing it, because this is what the current does, that the only way that true and radical change can happen is through government. Nah, says my conservative friends, I want less government so that less things can happen. But see, you're using government to limit so that you can make these kinds of changes happen, right? Liberals want to use government in a powerful way so that their changes can happen. But the reason that we see this kind of tension, this kind of anger, this kind of animosity and velocity on both sides, one, because cable news makes money that way. Remember, cable news is the devil. And what you see on both sides is thinking and seeing that the ultimate prize, the ultimate good is getting what we want in government. If we do that, it doesn't matter what else happens. It doesn't matter who you mess with, who you betray. It doesn't matter what idols you wind up worshiping. It doesn't matter what boundaries of morality and ethics that you wind up crossing or you wind up supporting someone who crosses those. Because what's the most important thing? Winning. 
you've heard it. You, you only remember hearing it from the side you don't agree with, but, you've, but it happens on both sides, right? We have to vote for this guy, otherwise we can't win and get blah, 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 blah. There is an idolatry there that says the most important thing that will happen in our country happens through government. Am I saying that government isn't important? I am not. But as Christians, our calling is to believe that God is bigger and more. Our calling is to believe that there are things that we don't go against for the sake of four years in the White House. There are things that we don't go against. We don't sell our souls to gain a little bit of the world. When we choose to make love our focus and make that our identity, then yeah, we can shatter that idol that is constantly speaking to us from both sides of the aisle and every other post on social media these days. It is not ultimate good that comes from either controlling and limiting government or controlling and directing government. The ultimate good is God. The ultimate good is Jesus. Jesus is the only hope for the world. Eventually, America will fall into dust, just like every country that has come before at some point will fall into dust. It will happen. The only thing that is forever is God's kingdom. That's where I choose to put my allegiance. That's where I choose to put my ultimate worship. And that's where I choose to believe that those ideals and that is what is worth the ultimate good. So it helps destroy the idolatry of government, but it also gives us a new energy and focus as we encounter difficult things in our world. This week, as you see these insurrectionists and terrorists scaling the Capitol and, and trying to break in and do whatever it is they were going to do, you could have been any number of emotions and any number of feelings. But when you, when you have allowed the Holy Spirit to use and work and move in and through you so that parts of you are being changed, even without you knowing it, what you hopefully notice is that that temptation to join in on whatever side you have, that temptation to share whatever that thing is that makes other people look bad, that temptation to call other people names and vilify other people and lump people together as one group that all does one thing all in one way, you see it for the poison that it is. And you see that it is not the way of love. And when you have decided that love is the ultimate ideal for what God has called you to and what you choose to live for, then that's where we begin to step away from the brokenness. That's where we choose to step out and answer and engage differently. For many, when they see the nastiness and brokenness of the world, what they say is, oh, I'm out. I'm just not going to be a part of it. So you have people who just won't talk about it. You have people who will argue passionately about sports or movies or computer games or whatever, but I just don't follow politics. I don't care about it. It's not that big a deal. Okay, the things that happen in our world matter, not just whether they affect you or not, because there are people who are living and dying because of these policies. And whatever thing it is that moves your heart, you have a responsibility to engage that because that's what love looks like too, right? Remember that from that middle part in the passage of Corinthians, that love cares when truth is spoken and love cares when truth wins, and so how do we live this out? What comes next, King George asked, and we ask as well. What comes next for us? The temptation is to join in with the world, with whatever side you, you are a part of, to join in and just participate either silently or vocally with that. What if God has something different for you? Because for me, that doesn't look like love. That doesn't look like Jesus that looks pretty similar to the rest of the world. So what is God calling us to do? 
And like always, uh, so many of you, I, I, this is going to sound like a sarcastic thing, and I, I promise you it's not. I am really grateful when you engage with me on the sermon. I'm grateful when you push back on something you don't agree with. I'm grateful when we can wrestle together through this, because this is big stuff, and I don't think I have all the answers all lined up, but I believe that if we don't have the conversation then we will revert back to the training of the world instead of the training of love that God is calling us to. So how do we live this out? couple of thoughts. The first one is we have to find places and spaces where we can speak our truth. But we have to do it, like Scripture says, in love. You don't have the option to just ignore what's going on in the world. You can choose to do that, but that isn't love. That isn't caring for your neighbor like God is calling you to. That isn't seeing that truth wins. The truth that you have seen and the truth that God has put on your heart, you have to figure out a way to speak that truth, but you have to do it in love. If you can't speak it in truth in love, then you're not ready to speak it yet. What I said on Wednesday is sometimes the holiest thing you can do is shut up. If you're not ready to speak the truth in love, you're not ready to speak it yet. So speak your truth and speak it in love. And speaking it in love means that you are holding out the possibility that you don't have the whole story of what's going on. You haven't cornered the market on what truth is, what truth looks like. And so you speak the truth that you see and understand and you speak it in love and then you hold what you have said humbly so that when other people interact with it, you are able to engage instead of attack. Is this stuff easy? It is not. Is this stuff perfectly perfectly practiced by your pastor? It is not. (laughs) I can't even lie. Sarah's here in the room. She will jump on and, and uh, share how many times where it's not. We, I am tempted so often to join the masses with the pitchforks and the torches on whatever side, on whatever issue, because I know that I'm 100% right. And these goofballs are 100% wrong. And if they just heard the clever put down that I gave to them, then they would know how wrong they are. Where's Jesus in that? Jesus is standing patiently waiting, saying, when you're ready, come back to me and let's work on love together. One of the most remarkable things about Jesus was the disciples that he chose. We always think about and talk about that he chose people who were sort of dunderheads like us, like Peter, but he also chose people, he chose Judas, who he knew would betray him, and that in itself is remarkable enough But he also chose Matthew or Levi, the tax collector, someone who had profited and basically um, scammed his way into wealth. He chose a guy like that, manipulating the governmental systems and scamming his way into wealth. He was a complete and total system government guy. He also chose a different guy named Simon. And Simon over here was a zealot. Now, zealot, like we mean, means you just are really ardently for something. But zealot had a very specific meaning in Jesus' time. The zealots were a group of people who were actively engaged in trying to violently overthrow the government. Jesus invited a seditious, insurrectionist terrorist and a big government guy to come together and both be transformed and changed. Because Jesus didn't say, I come to overthrow this individual government and Herod. Jesus didn't say, I came to work the system and get all the good I can come out of it. Jesus said, you all are arguing down here, and I'm doing something bigger and more. And when God's kingdom come, and when you care most about God's kingdom, all of this other stuff fades away. What God's deepest desire for us to do is to become so overflowing with love that even those who would oppose us can't help but complain about how loving we are. 
to be so overflowing with love that when we speak the truth that we see, people are able to hear it. Not because it's barbed with sarcasm, not because it comes in a funny meme that makes them look dumb or silly or hypocritical, but because they know our heart and they know the only reason we're speaking out is because the conviction in our spirit is so strong. This is what God calls us to. This is the worthy way that we can engage our world and our politics and our life. I am no longer interested in petty Facebook level kind of squabbles or uh, sarcastic comments. That does not bring about the transformed life Jesus wants. What comes next? Well, my friends, that's entirely up to us. Will we choose the way of Jesus, the way of love, or will we simply revert back to the training of our culture, swimming along on this overflowing tide of hate? Would you pray with me?